morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Today we're going to talk about yet another cinematic universe that Hollywood is building. They're building quite a few these days with Marvel really being the, the, the front runner, the inspiration to all the other studios. DC is building one. Uh, of course we have Sony's Spider-Man cinematic universe that's being put together. Universal is building a classic Monsters cinematic universe. And of course Fox has their own Marvel cinematic universe. But Fox, Fox wants to build another one, and this is a sci-fi cinematic universe. Now, of course, we've seen the Alien vs. Predator movies before, uh, but Fox wants to expand upon that by looping in Prometheus uh, via a comic book series that's going to come out uh, from Dark Horse. But I think as we're seeing these days, comic books are becoming the new testing ground for Hollywood. Uh, so while we're seeing this develop first on the page, I think it means that it could not, it might very well be, you know, far, not far behind on the silver screen. And if you bring in Prometheus, of course, Prometheus also began to loop in Blade Runner. Uh, so we could have another situation where maybe that comes into this group as well. And Fox also owns uh, the Planet of the Apes franchise. And so we might see that brought in if this is successful enough. So what's going on here in the comic books? Well, Dark Horse is putting out uh, four miniseries starting in September, both in comic book stores and digitally, that's going to be called Fire and Stone. And each miniseries is going to focus on a different brand from Fox. There will be uh, Prometheus Fire and Stone, Aliens Fire and Stone, AVP Fire and Stone, and then Predator Fire and Stone. Uh, it's going to have a different creative team behind each one, and they've put together a trailer for this comic book series that I've put a link below in the video description that you can check out, and it highlights two of the talents that are involved. Paul Tobin, who so far to date has worked mostly on Marvel's kids line, Marvel Adventures, but then also Kelly Sue DeConnick, who started out being Matt Fraction's wife. I know she hates that, uh, but I think that that did lead to a lot of work for her, uh, but I think that to her credit, she's rising above that and, you know, putting out some really solid uh, writing. She's certainly, I think, one of the stronger female comic book writers out there, uh, certainly better than another uh, wife of uh, a comic book uh, talent, uh, Stuart Eminen's wife, uh, Catherine. I, I'm not a big fan of her writing, but I think Kelly Sue, uh, while hit and miss a little bit, not as maybe reliable as some of the other writers that are working, male writers, uh, or, or even Gail Simone, although I think Gail Simone has become a little too much of a parody of herself, a little too one note. Uh, I think Kelly Sue, if I had to pick a good female comic book writer, I would certainly say she was the best working right now. So she's involved in this, and I think it's going to give it some much needed attention. Uh, Dark Horse, of course, uh, had the Star Wars brand for so long, but lost that to Disney, uh, you know, to Marvel when Disney acquired Marvel. Uh, so they still apparently have these Fox brands. So I'm curious to know what, although Fox did just sign a deal with Boom Studio, so one has to wonder how long Dark Horse will be able to hold on to these as well. Uh, that's another casualty of Hollywood getting so involved with the comic book market. Uh, you're seeing uh, properties be pulled to the different comic book publishers from the homes they've had for so long. But I'm curious what you guys think. The big story here is this sci-fi cinematic universe. Do you want to see Prometheus uh, looped into this? Do you want to see Aliens and Predator continue to be uh, uh, one? Do you like this crossover? I mean, I think for a while I regarded it as just a way to keep both properties active when Fox had no idea what to do with them. But as Prometheus, uh, while laughed at by many, including myself, uh, it still really renewed people's interest in the Alien franchise. And of course, they're making another Prometheus. Uh, so to loop it in here, uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. And I would say, though, that I, I would consider bringing Planet of the Apes into this. I feel I'd want to distance it from just being, you know, I don't want to expand the Alien versus Predator universe. I think the Fox sci-fi cinematic universe seems much more interesting to me. Although, poor Caesar, will he find himself in the predicament that many Hollywood stars find themselves in, uh, helping the company out by battling, say, an alien? Uh, uh, or Predator, I think that would be interesting indeed. Forget Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, let's see if Caesar can take uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sigourney Weaver. Let's see if Caesar can take these two down. Uh, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. Is something you think you would pick up? Do you think that Dark Horse does a good job with these properties? Uh, or do you think it's time for them to move over to Boom? Uh, also, do you want to see Planet of the Apes brought into this? Or do you think it should save itself? Uh, so that's the first story of the day. Very interesting. And also, just what do you think of cinematic universes in general? Does every everything have to be tied together or is Hollywood just going a little bit cinematic universe crazy? 
All right, so the second story of the day has to do with Guardians of the Galaxy and the intense focus on merchandising. Uh, as you know, we've discussed the Gamora situation where people have been very upset they can't get anything with Gamora on it or a Gamora action figure. Then I have some tweets from some of you that said they did put out a Gamora action figure at the Disney store and it sold out like within 24 hours. So that just shows you the demand. And then over the weekend, uh, Marvel tweeted out that they are indeed making a dancing Groot. Not quite a dancing Groot. It's a bobblehead Groot, you know, of Groot in the pot, you know, baby Groot. Um, but it doesn't actually, it's not a, an electronic. It doesn't dance so much as bobble. I think that's a little bit of a cheap shortcut. I want like a Spencer's gift level dancing Groot. I want him to have an on and off switch and I want him to actually dance and to look just like he did in the movie. I think it would be so easy to do. I don't see what's taking so long. Although I will say that they have a Rocket Raccoon plush that came out and I did go to FAO Shorts to purchase it for my sister because she loves Rocket Raccoon so much. And it was a very good plush to the point where he even actually looked a little angry and I thought that was great. So uh, I'm very curious as to why you guys think that more so than any other Marvel property, Guardians of the Galaxy is so merchandise friendly. Also, the soundtrack's doing incredibly well. So you have a big, intense push for Gamora merchandise, Rocket Raccoon, a dancing Groot, the soundtrack. What is it? My guess would be the nostalgia factor and also referencing a time when people had a lot of knickknacks. Uh, you know, there's a troll doll in the movie. Uh, action figures were very big in the 80s. Uh, you know, it was a big uh, period of collectibles, you know, before everything kind of went digital. So I'm, I think that might be what's uh, factoring into it, that you've really piqued the interest and captured the imaginations of the collecting uh, demographic, you know, slightly older. You know, we I recently talked about with you guys those toys they have at the movie theater. And the movie theater uh, uh, manager was like, I can't believe adults are buying these. And it's like, of course they're buying them. Adults love this kind of stuff. You put it on your desk, you put it, you know, at home or at work, uh, depending how forgiving your work environment is. And it's, you know, just something that gives you a little bit of joy during the day when you glance over at it. So I think that's what's going on. I think it's the nostalgia aspect because you certainly don't see this kind of merchandising push for Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Soldier. Even for Maleficent, there's not a lot of merchandise for that uh, movie uh, as well. So Guardians of the Galaxy, I think, is hearkening back to a day when there was a lot of merchandising, uh, which is something you just don't see so much these days. So I'm curious to what merchandise you've bought. As I said, I have the Rocket Raccoon stuffy, uh, or plush, I guess is the correct term. I like to call them stuffies. Uh, and I'm curious to know what kind of dancing group do you want? Is the bobblehead enough, or do you think this is just a patch job and you want the Spencer's gift? version. I'd expect it would be available for the holiday season. Though. I'm sure they're working on uh, a more legitimate dancing Groot as we speak. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, the third story of the day, something else a number of you tweeted to me. It made some great headlines. Uh, I saw it myself over on CNN, and that's that they're continuing to really go after piracy, this time in the UK, where a gentleman for filming Fast 6 and then offering it for download online was sentenced to almost three years in prison. And the person who helped him, his sister's boyfriend, uh, got about 120 hours of community service. But uh, this individual will actually be doing hard time for a decent amount of time. Uh, and the, the reasoning was is that since he had sold it, you know, he had offered it for download for money and it had been downloaded an estimated 700,000 times, that was a substantial financial loss to the distributors uh, for the film. And I agree with that. So you're seeing uh, the legal system, not just in the United States, but, you know, also in the UK, and I would start to suspect other countries, uh, really considerably go after this kind of piracy because look how much money is being lost. And also this person, unlike a lot of the download and torrent sites, it was easy to find. He made himself someone easy to find. So it just goes to show that if it wasn't so hard to find these individuals who are doing the bulk of piracy, they also would be, per would be persecuted. And you have to wonder, with, with considering the push with Lionsgate uh, for Expendables 3, maybe they will start to develop teams, investigative teams, who can find these individuals. But this guy didn't make it hard at all. Uh, he not only uh, made uh, advertised the download on his Facebook page, but also on the piracy sites, he used a handle that he also happened to use on a dating website as well, the exact same handle. So the police didn't have a very hard time tracking him down. So I'm curious to what you think. I'm in favor of this. Uh, you know, I don't want to see, you know, look what happened to Legend of Korra. That really hurts, I think, the not only the show, but the people working on it. Uh, and so I'm in favor of doing this. And you know what? 
I paid $4 for The Legend of Korra. I downloaded the uh, episodes via Amazon this weekend. Uh, I did a review for that because so many of you asked me to talk about the season finale. But I paid my, my $2 an episode, and, you know, that wasn't that much. You know, it wasn't that bad. And these price points are so low. You can pay them. It's not like, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars to see a movie. Although I guess some of you would say it is when you factor in the food and the travel costs, etc. cetera. Uh, but anyway, I'm curious to what you guys think. And also, almost three years, what do you think of that sentence? Uh, I'd be very curious to know your thoughts on this as well, as this is a story that's not only develop not only not going away, but it's developing. All right, so on to the viewer question. This is from Eric Carden. And I love this viewer question. I love these behind the scenes questions because, you know, a lot of people start out wanting to be actors in Hollywood and the big, you know, the, the big quote unquote big gigs like director, screenwriter. Uh, but there are so many other very exciting and lucrative jobs in Hollywood uh, where you can really be a part of the movie magic. So I love discussing the different aspects of the movie industry so that, you know, you don't have to think that those are your only ins. So Eric Carden is, is working on being a producer. So his question is, um, I watch your videos every day, uh, almost addicted like Walter White's math, LOL. Oh, that's awesome. I uh, even kind of have a blue hue behind me, right? Uh, so Eric says, I'm currently in the works to produce a student film at college with a cast and crew size of about 25 people. That's very big for a student film, Eric. So kudos to you for putting that together. <clears throat> and you must be making a very ambitious film. So Eric continues saying, uh, which is a bit nerve wracking considering I'm a psych major with only some experience with this crew. His question is, how many people do producers and directors really get to know or even remember uh, their names of on a big movie project? How do you keep track of over 100 people on a cast and crew? Excellent question, Eric. Well, there are different levels, obviously, of crews in Hollywood. At the indie level, where everybody's working very hard, they're still on the, you know, the pizza uh, budget, you know, that's a very popular saying where, you know, I bought pizza for everybody for their meals, uh, you know, staying in the same motel room, working long hours to get this thing done. I think in that instance, everybody knows everyone else. It's a very friendly uh, set. You're together for long hours and you're in very close quarters. Uh, and also everyone's very grateful to everybody for working on the film because it really is a labor of love. It's hard to get made. Um, people are making sacrifices, often taking pay cuts. I think that's where there's a real sense of camaraderie on those small indie films. But when you start to get to the bigger Hollywood level, of course, everybody does not know everybody else. I mean, I think that there's crossover into each different you know, section of the film. And by section, I'm talking about the different departments. So the set department, the scripting department, the actors, the uh, lighting. Uh, cinematography, a sound, you know, everybody kind of is in their little, their little uh, movie gang. And so there is some crossover because you are standing next to each other all day, but you really know the people best in your group. Uh, everybody who's working together in sound or uh, knows each other, everybody working together in cinematography knows each other, etc. Uh, and then your director will know your key people because each one of those gangs has a leader and that leader's job is to, to report to the director and the producer and so they do know the names of those key players because that's who they're interacting with uh, and then that person knows everybody's name in their group because their job is to manage that group so you're really seeing a hierarchy because it's so many moving parts uh, that that's how uh, it works. So in a big movie set, uh, the producer wouldn't know the name of every single grip. He might recognize them, you know, he might get, you know, recognize them and uh, have a visual uh, reference, but he wouldn't necessarily know their full name. And he doesn't need to because he's not the one who hires them. He hires the head of that department who then has their go-to guys or girls uh, or both. And that's, that's kind of the way it works. So that's the chain of command. But on a small film like yours, Eric, especially because it's a student film, I would recommend that you get to know every one. Because on a student film, I can't imagine you're paying them. You're probably providing them with uh, transportation and food, I would imagine. So, you know, they're doing you a big favor by working on this. Uh, and I'm sure also this is a situation where, you know, they're maybe working out of their comfort zone. Because, you know, when you're in film school, uh, you don't have your unions. You don't have your gangs. Everybody's, you know, on one film I did lighting, on another film I did sound. You know, I also was a script supervisor here. You know, you take the job you need to take because you're learning the ropes and you also just want to experience it and see what it's like. Uh, so that's also, you know, something to be grateful for. Someone taking out a job they normally wouldn't uh, and just saying, hey, you know what, I'll give it a try for you. But it sounds like you have a really interesting production you've put together, Eric. And I, you know what, everybody has to start somewhere. Don't let your lack of experience be uh, something that intimidates you or makes you you nervous. Uh, everybody there is on the same page uh, just to have a good time and, and you want to have the confidence to inspire everyone else. You're the leader, you're in charge, uh, and everyone's going to be looking to you for 
uh, guidance and inspiration. But again, it's a big crew, very exciting. I hope your film works out. Uh, and then also, I hope I've explained to everybody a little bit how a film set works. So you not only know how to get a job, you don't go to the producer if you're not going to be the head uh, lighting guy. You want to go to the guy who's in charge of that. Uh, so you understand the hierarchy. And also, if you find yourself on a set, you're not insulted if the producer doesn't stop you and say hi. You realize you have to work your way up to a position where you are in that core group where the director and the producer are working with you. It's just the way it is. Don't ever take that stuff personally. Uh, and it, it works that way because it's just easier to run things. You know, just like when you're in the army, for instance, you don't go and talk to, if you're just a soldier, you talk to your your battalion leader and then that person talks to their commander and so far it works its way up. It's just it's an effective way to run things. So thank you for your question Eric. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in today. Please write down uh, below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.